to talk about our work in the Blue Waters uh, resource. And we've been using this machine since it kind of came into existence over the past five years. And what our group does is look at biomolecular systems smaller than what Romney talked about. As a matter of fact, I should have had Romney come and give my talk today because she did such a great job with hers. Um, but we want to look at the structure dynamics interactions of molecules. Um, an idea mainly to understand reproducibility in these simulations, convergence, and ultimately agreement with the experiment, which turns out to be challenging in many cases. And I liked uh, what Juan did in his talk where he talked about kind of the products of what came out of the Blue Waters effort. Uh, so I, I kind of stole that uh, idea a bit. Uh, we've had three PRAC awards and won uh, Ebola Rapid Award, uh, probably about 50 publications since about 2013 when we started using the machine. Um, really enabled by the GPU acceleration of AMBER, and we've seen release of AMBER 14, AMBER 16, and AMBER 18 over this time frame. AMBER 18 just came out in April. Um, we developed and understand much better multidimensional replica exchange methods. Uh, we had to modify our code for analysis when we started to do large ensembles of simulations. We tried to analyze it with a single node and it would kind of take out the Lustre file system. So we had to parallelize the analysis code to look at effectively each different ensemble instance on a different node. Um, and so we were able to get the code to do that. Uh, the paper was finally accepted last week. It's been, it was like three years in uh, review and development because the reviewers didn't like it, but uh, finally got it accepted. Uh, we've been able to evaluate various methods. There's been some concerns about are there differences in the re results you would get, say, on D.E. Shaw's Anton machine, or if you run NAMD or Gromax or Amber. And we've kind of been able to show that we can get reproducible results among these codes and understand uh, where methodological differences have uh, effect and where they don't have effect. Um, we refined a lot of NMR structures. We looked at the magnesium dependence of RNA structures. We started to use uh, this hydrogen mass repartitioning uh, scheme in our integration, where we move some of the mass of the heavy atom to the hydrogen, which allows us to go to a four femtosecond time step for the MD instead of a two femtosecond, so it effectively doubled our performance with no change on the results. But the biggest aspects that have been enabled are being able to show that we can get reproducible results with different initial conditions and also converge the conformational distributions. In, in other words, understand all the conformations that are populated at a particular temperature. And with overcoming the sampling problem, that allows us to kind of assess and validate the force fields, figure out where they need fixing and to, to optimize them. Uh, the family tree of amber force fields, this doesn't show charm, shows a lot of evolution over the time frame from uh, about the Barcelona era, the BSC zero, and other groups involved in this effort. And more recently, we've started to play with the Van der Waals parameters to try to make um, them better. We can use either very long simulation or uh, various multidimensional replica exchange approaches to converge the conformational ensembles of various models. For example, duplexes, and this was shown in Romney's slide uh, where we can get remarkable agreement with the average NMR structures uh, for this dickerson dodecamer sequence. Uh, this is one of the best, highest resolution NMR structures. There's 20 structures that they produce. We average them together, and when we compare what we get with the latest force fields, which include the Barcelona 1 force field uh, from Edesto Orozco, and the OL15, which is the, uh, from the Spooner team in Olamush, um, we get agreement that's sub half angstrom from those structures, which is just remarkable. Uh, in the old days, we were happy if we were two angstroms away from the experimental structure. And so this is kind of at the noise limit of the experiment in some sense. Uh, it's, we'd never really get to zero, uh, but it's pretty cool. Uh, but we also can look at other things like RNA dinucleotides, tetranucleotides, tetra loops, uh, now mini dumbbells. Uh, and we can assess the force fields um, where we see differences from experiment. We can go weight, reweight them with Maxent methods shown by uh, Giovanni Busi and Sandro Bataro uh, to kind of figure out what the correct experimental distribution is because in many cases we don't have a really good idea of what the true experimental distribution for a tetranucleotide should be. 
Um, the dinucleotides um, are an interesting system because we can converge these in a couple hours on, on blue waters. And the conformational distributions we see actually catch a lot of the features that we see go wrong in bigger simulations with anomalous structures. So like the ladder structure or uh, the inverted structure are things that are overpopulated in larger RNA sequences. Uh, so we can do a lot of parameter scanning and, and force field work just on the dinucleotide and see how that impacts the larger systems, which is kind of cool. And we can look at, so the, the plot down below is kind of showing a population histogram uh, of conformations a certain distance away from an A-form um, reference. And we can do various changes to the force field, like change the size of the phosphate oxygens, change uh, sugar pucker parameters, and see how the distributions shift, uh, which is kind of nice. Um, we did refine over this time frame a lot of NMR structures. So one of these ones here, uh, there were two NMR structures of a very similar uh, RNA duplex that had a, a kind of a, a bulge in the middle. Uh, the bulge was different in the two structures. But if you compare the structure on the far left and the one on the far right, those are the experimental structures. And when we started to run the one on the far left, it fell apart in the simulation of blue waters. And so we're like, huh, that's kind of bad. So why don't we try to re-refine the structures using modern simulation protocols, all the NMR data that's there, um, water and salt. And when we did that for the two different structures, we actually got a structure that's very similar for the two different systems and better fits the NMR data than the originally published structures, which is kind of nice. So if we have experimental restraints, we can do a very good job with reproducing RNA structure. Um, uh, we need extensive sampling. Uh, we, can, we have to be careful of bad assignments of the NMR data. If we have residual dipolar coupling data, that's even better. Um, but there's still not an easy way to automatically refine these structures. Another case, and that's, that's the paper, another case was uh, this particular one from the Varku uh, satellite ribosome stem loop five that had two structures in the, in the experimental database, uh, a magnesium dependent structure and a, a magnesium free structure. The two were different. And again, when we ran the original NMR structures in simulations, they fell apart. So we again went back and re-refined the structures. And what was interesting is that when we re refine it, we get a tighter distribution of, of conformations we see, and it's kind of like two states. And that's in the magnesium free structure. Um, and what happens is when you add magnesium, it kind of selects one of those states and shifts the structure. And we're able to demonstrate that in the simulations. Um, but I showed this slide last year. Uh, one of the concerns in the field all the time is about magnesium. It has a plus two charge, it's a highly polarizable ion. And we're not, we're assuming a fixed charge model in these kind of simulations. And people say, well, you can't represent magnesium, just put in high potassium. And, but it turns out we can uh, represent magnesium and many different magnesium models. We've tried many of them that are in the literature. All are able to induce the correct conformation of this magnesium dependent structure spontaneously in the simulation if it gets it caught in time. And what happens is if, if an ion goes to the wrong place, uh, the lifetime of an ion that's directly chelated to RNA is on the order of milliseconds. And we're running microsecond time scales, a thousand times slower, or, or a thousand times less long. Um, and so if you're unlucky to trap an ion initially, uh, you will never escape from that unless you do tricks to kind of force the ions on and off, or if you make the ion interaction weaker. But if you do that, you may not have the, the ion-induced uh, effect on the structure you want to see. But it's cool that we can see these magnesium-dependent influences. More recently, we've been looking at these uh, NMR-determined uh, mini dumbbell-type structures that are shown here. Um, and again, we can reproduce the structures for some limited period of time. Uh, again, the NMR structures were kind of like spaghetti. If we re-refine them, we get a much tighter set of structures. One of the concerns uh, in these dumbbells, actually, uh, one of the systems here, this CCTG, um, the NMR proposed that there's a base pair that's formed, uh, CC, I think, base pair, 
and uh, we don't see that in our simulations, that it immediately shifts, and we think that's because they solved the structure at a low pH, and it's probably a protonated cysteine in there. Um, so we're still investigating that aspect. But it's another system where we can get complete sampling. Um, now, one of the issues you've heard about, if you've heard me talk before, is always the question of, are the force fields reliable? And if we run short simulations, we tend to stay near the experimental structure and well reproduce experimental properties. But what we've seen throughout my career from the early 90s through today, anytime we get a bigger machine and we run for longer, we suddenly find new structures that are lower in energy or lower in free energy than the experimental structures, and we never come back to the experiment. We move away. And that's still true. But on the other hand, I told you that with the DNA, we really super accurately reproduce this duplex structure. But then with RNA, it goes haywire. Uh, why is that? So here's with the, with the mini dumbbells, if I run shorter simulations on the order of three microseconds, they're stable with this particular uh, force field. Um, with this water model, some of them fall apart more quickly, but if I run longer, essentially all the simulations fall apart and never come back to experiment, which is really kind of annoying. Um, and I don't need to waste time in the movie to just gonna show it falling apart. Um, we can, with certain force fields and with an, a sufficient enhanced sampling, with a temperature replica exchange or multidimensional replica exchange, we can fold to the correct structure from a linear one, so we can fold this mini dumbbell, and it gets pretty close to the, the experimental structure, but it's only 12% of the population, whereas if it was only 12% of the population, I mean, if the other confirmations were really real, they would have polluted the NMR data and you would have seen them. So what have we learned throughout this time? Uh, that ensembles of independent simulations or proper enhanced sampling simulations can uh, converge, uh, that it, the differences between running independent simulations and uh, long Anton simulations and running replica exchange don't affect the results, uh, and we can converge these ensembles uh, very well. However, they mostly overpopulate anomalous conformations. Uh, I've shown this before, so I won't show it again, but it's showing kind of convergence of various things. Now, DNA is, is great. RNA, where it has non-duplex structure, is awful. Why? Why is that happening? Well, one way to think about it is the balance. So if you think of a DNA duplex, if your hydrogen bonding strength is a little bit off or the stacking is a little bit off, it's not influenced because there's not an alternative thing for it to hydrogen bond with because it's in the Watson-Crick helix. It's kind of trapped there. And if the stacking is a little too tight or too weak, um, it doesn't really affect the structure. It may affect the melting temperature or base pair opening times, but it's not going to affect the structure. But now in RNA, where you've got all these many possible intermolecular interactions, if any one of those is off or is too sticky, you might get trapped in that particular one, and that's what we see happen. A good example with the tetranucleotide is this particular conformation, uh, which doesn't fit the experimental data at all. We just have two strong interactions between the phosphates and some of the oxygens and so forth. This isn't uh, limited solely to RNA. If you look at proteins, and a particular protein like dihydrofolate reductase, which has uh, regular secondary structure, but also has subtle loop-loop interactions that define uh, its activity related to whether it has cofactors bound, ligands bound, so forth, what we find found back in 2004, or earlier when I started those simulations, we saw spaghetti of loop conformations. And today, when we re-ran them with the newer force fields on Blue Waters, we still see a spaghetti of conformations because of slight misbalance in those interactions, very reminiscent of what we're seeing with the RNA. Um, why I should know about balance? Well, in the old days, we would run without salt and RNA would blow up. So clearly, salt's important. I knew that if we ran with the wrong salt parameters, we'd form beautiful salt crystals in our simulations, and those salt crystals would destroy DNA structure. And so we built specific force fields uh, for the ions that matched different water models. So I knew there was a water model uh, dependence. I didn't think at the time that RNA is in fact a polyanion. It's probably gonna be dependent on the water model too. It took me many years to figure that out. We did, finally. We had run simulations in the past uh, 
to look at a very small system with a, not much water in it for DNA to see uh, if that influenced the property, the structure, and the dynamics. And we knew that infinite helices formed in nanoseconds in these simulations, suggesting we might be overstacking a bit. And later, uh, when I ran the Anton results where we saw that the DNA was effectively rigid on a, on a one to five microsecond time scale, I thought, well, maybe that's because there's no collisions with other molecules. I'll put some other molecules in there, some more DNA, and see if we see enhanced dynamics in that time range. And again, we saw these infinite helices form immediately. So I should have known about the balance. So what are the problems that still remain? Force field balance or misbalance, uh, sampling trapped confirmations. You can get, you can, it may take a long time to find a confirmation you've never seen before. Uh, force field methods interoperability, that's not so much a problem anymore. I think that we have good agreement among the different codes and methods and approaches as long as you don't make an error in the force field conversion. Uh, we can look at results from other groups and show how they compare to ours. Um, we're understanding I and uh, so the question where we go now is how to assess and improve. And that's where we're using these small model systems, way smaller than the stuff you heard about in Rami's talk. Uh, tens of base pairs, up to 20 uh, big nucleotides or 30 nucleotides, rather than these millions of atom systems. Okay, so if the force fields are broken, can we still use them? Yeah, if you don't run long enough uh, on the RNA. Uh, what if we bias it from experiment? Well, we can put in, in RNA, for example, if we know it's a UUCG tetra loop, we know what the structure of that is. If we put in restraints that kind of force that structure, that can help, and just an example uh, of this is, I'll show in pictures, we had coarse grain uh, models from the Dolkian lab, uh, and we took those and, and did simulations in implicit solvent with some experimental restraints that we inferred from known structures, and we get structures that are closer to um, the true experimental structures, the ones on the right with different systems. Okay, I already mentioned the CBP TRAGE developments, the new paper is gonna come out soon. Um, I can kind of stop for questions. I just want to show one little thing that since I have time, we're also looking at, at staple peptides, which is kind of cool. This is a collaboration in my wife's lab. And we can show that these staples improve the stability of the, the drug target. But when we did the experiment, the staples disappeared immediately in plasma. Uh, and we didn't know why. It turns out if you run the monomers, the monomers fold up and that makes them more susceptible to proteolysis. And that's why the staples don't actually work.